Okay, today's lecture is on uh, innovation in academia and industry, in universities and business. And we did the uh, discussion session and now we will start the lecture. So as described, we've finished the first half of the course, which have been the fundamentals and history of innovation. And today we'll be doing the methods and applications, in particular, the innovation in academia and business. In other words, methods of innovation too. So the discussion period, we talked about these two questions. What do you think is the most innovative university in the world? And what do you think is the most innovative company in the world? Many of you gave some very good answers. Uh, and that raises the, raise the issue of how do we define innovation uh, in terms of a way to rank and measure different companies and universities. We have uh, throughout the first part of the course talked about the definition of innovation, the different kinds of innovation. We've tried to understand innovation as a process of bringing new ideas and new combinations of old ideas to reality uh, and all that's involved in that. But we haven't really measured innovation in a quantitative way. We'll do a little bit of that in today's lecture, and we will explore the concept of measuring innovation in more detail in next week's lecture. Suffice to say that the measurement of innovation is not very precise, and we'll explore the reasons for that uh, in an introductory sense in today's lecture. So we will quickly review last week's lecture, which was Innovation Methods 1, Neurobiology of Learning and Innovation. So some background, some basic neurobiology, and the talk about the mind and creativity. We will do this very quickly because it is a review. We discussed this Paul Clay painting uh, in the Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, a painting to depict one who understands one who has really learned, not just memorized, but who understands. And we talked about this painting and what kind of feeling it's presenting. And in the end, we talked about this feeling of uh, satisfaction, a feeling of uh, a pleasant feeling of understanding, a serious feeling, uh, uh, all these feelings very hard to describe in words, which is why a painting is very powerful. And we talked about uh, feeling and emotion and passion as being central to learning. So how does learning occur? Well, obviously it occurs in the brain with neurons. There are two types of neurons or neural cells, uh, neurons and glial cells. And these neurons, which are the main one, have a property of being irritable. Irritable means creating electrical changes in response to stimuli. The neuron has two parts. It has a cell body called the soma. It has a appendage called the axon where these electrical signals are sent down. Local potentials or small electrical changes arrive at the dendrites in the body. And at a certain point with enough of the stimulation, the axon will create an action potential or a signal going down. Different neurons will communicate with each other by what are called synapses, whereby the presynaptic neuron uh, will transmit signals to the postsynaptic neuron across this connection, which is called the synapse. In other words, information is transmitted from one neuron to the other neuron or a muscle cell via the synapse. On the postsynaptic cell, we can have three possible results. One is a uh, local potential, in other words, a small voltage change. The second is an action potential or a big voltage change. And the third possible change, which is not necessarily mutually exclusive, is a form of biochemical changes which underlie learning. We discussed how there are two types of synapses, electrical synapses and chemical synapses. And these chemical synapses involve these changes uh, where voltage changes will stimulate the release of a neurotransmitter 
will bind to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell, resulting in voltage changes in the postsynaptic cell. So how does synaptic learning occur? Well, before learning, we have those synapses uh, configured in a set way. And after learning, those synapses typically have some changes, particularly on the postsynaptic side. Uh, for example, an increased number of receptors so that the signaling is faster, more efficient. This is a process that has been experimentally evaluated in what's called long-term potentiation. In other words, if you do a stimulus and record in the postsynaptic cell, you'll see a small change. But if you do a continuous stimulus and then do it again, you'll see a big, uh, or not a big one, but you'll see a bigger uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential, EPSP. And that process is the biochemical, it's very simple, of course, but the core biochemical process behind learning. So what happens is all these synapses develop, you have the biochemical changes in their efficiency and in their number. Uh, and sleep is very important for learning. Uh, during the day, you are getting more of these synapses active. And then at night, you are actually uh, culling them out. Some of the synapses which were considered not so efficient will be eliminated or less efficient. And that process produces, in a sense, a more learned, more educated uh, set of uh, nervous system at this end here. And then we talked about the difference between linear and logarithmic learning. So on the vertical axis, we had the number of brain cells used. On the horizontal axis, the amount of knowledge learned. And in the linear sense, you have basically more knowledge means more brain cells. In fact, linearly more brain cells. So double the amount of knowledge, you need more double the amount of synapses of brain cells. The logarithmic learning is uh, by increasing the amount of knowledge learned, but not in a linear sense, but logarithmically. How is that accomplished? That is accomplished by learning new ideas connected to existing ideas. And by making those connections, the each additional new knowledge that we add is not requiring a whole extra sort of resources to remember it, it needs less resources because you are remembering it or learning it in relationship to the previous knowledge. So for example, when I'm expressing this concept here of linear versus logarithmic learning, I am talking about it also after the segment on nerve cells. So you learn about nerve cells, but you're also learning about this concept, linear versus logarithmic learning, in the context of nerve cells. So to learn more, we need more brain cells. But with linear learning, we need a proportionate number of brain cells. With logarithmic learning, we don't need as much brain cells the more we learn. So I'm connecting the previous lecture or the previous segment with the current segment. So hopefully, these are not two separate slides. They are connected to each other. So how you learn what we just talked about is going to be more efficient. Now, why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because creativity is just connecting things. New, old ideas connected in new ways or you see something, you're curious about something and you remember something else and you say, oh, that can be an improvement or that can be a, a change, something innovative. So creativity is just connecting things. That's what Steve Jobs said. So learning is also about creating, uh, connecting things. So there is a connection between learning in this way and creativity. So this lecture was very important, not just for this course, but if it provides you with a way of learning that's more efficient, you are a student after all, 
and your job is to learn, right? If that helps you learn better, that's good. But if it helps you not only learn better, but it helps you be more innovative, that's even better, right? So this, if you're always trying to learn something and making connections, you're training the mind to make connections. And so later on in the future, you can never predict creativity by definition. You can't predict innovation. One of you may be the next Steve Jobs. I don't know. But if you practice this, there would be a higher chance of being that creative. Okay? So, uh, that's the review. Now we go to the part of the uh, lecture, Methods and Innovation to Innovation in Academia and Business, uh, Universities and Corporate Research Labs. We'll talk about some background. We'll talk about university research and we'll talk about corporate research. Now, we already discussed this very important paradigm in innovation, which is the Vannevar Bush concept that he described after World War II, just after World War II, uh, in his uh, recommendation to the president, science, the endless frontier. So he was very famous. And so when we look at universities like Harvard and Stanford, MIT that you described in Oxford. Some of these are very old universities, that's true. In fact, most of them are old universities, relatively speaking, among the oldest. But their current sort of uh, system largely came out of this work. It's very important to consider. So. Harvard was founded in 1636, 1638. Um, there's some debate when, uh, but uh, the Harvard that we know now with the research labs and the teaching and the government funding and you know, all these uh, discoveries and Marius was mentioning the patents and all that came out of this system. So what is this system? This system is the separation of basic science and applied research. And the concept that Vannevar Bush wrote is the importance of science in uh, national strength and the economy. This was very well established in World War II. The United States defeated Japan and the large part of that was the atomic weapons, which was, of course, science and technology. So for countries to succeed, uh, not just war, but other things too, hopefully we don't have wars, but innovation and in particular science is very important. That's why we're talking about this, it's about innovation. So the question is, you can't just yell at people and say innovate and, or science and do it. You have to organize it. So this uh, report, uh, Science the Endless Frontier, basically at the end of uh, World War II, said that science can be effective in the national welfare only as a member of a team, whether the conditions be peace or war, but without scientific progress, no amount of achievement in other direction can secure ensure our health, prosperity, and security as a nation in the modern world. So it set the primacy of this science. But uh, specifically, science was going to be in the universities and applied research was going to be in the uh, industry. And the basic research was going to be funded by the government and the applied research was going to be funded by the private sector. And that's the basic paradigm. We do that in Korea. Uh, you know, China likes to be different, but they do that as well. Uh, United States certainly does that. Uh, Europe does that. That's the model. So we are here and we just assume that's the way it always is. But that model very much came out of this report. Uh, so let's talk about this in more detail. So this concept of basic versus applied research. So we have two dimensions here. Remember we said consultants like to spread things in 
or analyze things in two by two boxes. So on the left hand side, we have quest for fundamental understanding, yes or no. And on the horizontal axis, we have considerations of use, yes or no. So if we have a quest for fundamental understanding and really no plan for its use, we call this pure basic research. And a good embodiment of pure basic research was Niels Bohr. He was the Danish physicist and helped develop uh, quantum mechanics and uh, so forth. If you have a quest for fundamental understanding, yes, but you're also motivated by use and practicality, this would be use-inspired basic research. And a perfect example, of course, is Louis Pasteur, who established a lot of microbiology, but he did this in the context of curing rabies. Uh, we may do a lot of basic research for COVID, but the uh, use inspiration is for a vaccine or for other treatments. And then if there are no interest in fundamental understanding and just for uh, considerations of use, this would be pure applied research. An example would be Thomas Edison. So he's not interested in discovering new laws of physics. He wants to produce the light bulb or the phonograph. Now, this implies that we separate these. And I actually think that the world has changed since Vannevar Bush. I believe in the example of Einstein that I demonstrated to you uh, previous lectures, that even the most basic research has some element of practical use inspiration. Maybe not to apply it necessarily, but thinking about real world problems. So for example, during our discussion session, I showed you the Facebook post of the solar panels. And the very practical thing of the Air Force pilots being blinded by the reflection of the light. But that leads to a certain curiosity, it's so, sort of strangeness. I say, well, if the purpose of a solar panel is to absorb light, convert it to electricity, right? Why is it reflecting light? You know, you have conservation of photons. Uh, if you have 100% photons absorbed, you will have 0% reflected. But if you have 10% reflected, you only get 90% absorbed. So you will have some inefficiency in the energy conversion. So that's a very practical thing. It's practical for the pilots. It's also practical for um, conversion to electricity, photoelectric cells. But if there is some intrinsic reflection, maybe there's some basic physics about how photons interact with matter and materials that we need to understand more. So I believe there is a very close interaction between these. And I think that in a simpler world, and perhaps this was the case after World War II, uh, it's always difficult to say, we were not there, none of us, but uh, uh, I imagine certain things were simpler at that time maybe this model was very effective. And we always have to be thinking of improving and how circumstances may have changed. And so in our current world, maybe there's a closer link between the two. So I believe that there is a false dichotomy. Dichotomy means difference, separation between basic and applied research. So some of the precepts of Vannevar Bush was that applied science invariably drives out the pure. It's almost as if they, they corrupt or interfere with each other. And basic research is the pacemaker. It, it stimulates technological process and the separation of these two. And that superior, the basic research was a little more you know, superior and got the prestigious grants and that's what the Harvard does. They don't do the applied research. Uh, and it was believed that with some basic research, 
while it could not be predicted the specifics that there would be some automatic use at some time in some place of this research. So one of the reasons why I think this is a false dichotomy and I presented the, some of this a little bit earlier was in the concept of Albert Einstein. And we regard Albert Einstein as the epitome, even more than Niels Bohr, uh, the epitome of a pure scientist. So he, of course, discovered relativity, special relativity and general relativity. He discovered the photoelectric effect, which was an uh, underpinning of quantum theory. Uh, and of course, he tried to develop in his lifetime a theory of everything a very fundamental theory of physics. So people imagine him as a pure scientist. Uh, in some respects, Vannevar Bush was correct. These very pure considerations of relativity uh, actually have had some significant practical use. So for example, it turns out that GPS requires an understanding of general relativity. It's not just an esoteric theory of gravity. It is required for the effective implementation of the global positioning system of GPS. But aside from that sort of practical aspects, Einstein in his day was actually motivated and influenced by practical use. And as you may recall, Albert Einstein was not a professor at any university when he came up with his first miraculous uh, discoveries. Uh, he was a clerk in the patent office here in Bern. And he wrote that working on the final formulation of technological patents, which is a very practical, non-basic science, was a veritable blessing. It enforced many-sided thinking and also provided important stimuli to physical thought. So he's being a little bit, uh, how should I say, uh, literary in his description. So let's actually understand what he means by these statements. Uh, relativity describes the changes in space and time or how space and time which were previously under newton considered absolute how space and time can be changed as a result of movement and that's why it's called relativity because as a result of movement but if the laws of physics remain the same then space and time become relative and they change but what stimulated this very uh, strange thought was the, the technological, the practical need to synchronize clocks. And those clocks need to be synchronized, especially for making the train system in Switzerland on time. So you need to have one station and another station far away. They have to have the same time. But Einstein was thinking, what does it mean to synchronize clocks? You have to send a signal from one station to the other. Uh, you have to send a signal from the moving train to the station. They have to be all synchronized. Some of them are moving, some of them are not relative to each other. This raised all sorts of interesting fundamental questions. How does one synchronize clocks? Now, this is not a physics course, but it was that very practical use, like Thomas Edison, that also stimulated very basic thinking. So, uh, in the case of what some people consider the greatest scientist of all time, Albert Einstein, it was the greatest basic scientist, it was the ability to actually connect with very real world problems that is uh, likely very much uh, related to why he was able to make such great discoveries. So I don't believe there is such a dichotomy. Now, why do I spend time on this dichotomy or separation? Because even though I 
argue that we need to bring those together more, the reality is that university research is still quite separate from corporate research. So in terms of this lecture, we will indeed separate them and talk about them separately for now. But keep in mind what I mentioned that I believe that the world is moving to a more integrated model. So let's talk a little bit about university research. So a number of important innovations actually came from university research. These are just some of them, just for sake of uh, uh, overview. The seat belt uh, in cars was uh, the first modern version was developed at Cornell University. Many uh, aspects of the internet were developed at universities. Uh, the periodic table was created by uh, Mendeleev, a professor at St. Petersburg University that you're familiar with, rocket fuel at Clark University, uh, University of Florida with Gatorade, flu shots at the University of Rochester, obviously a lot of drugs and chemotherapy at many universities, CT scan, CAT scanning in Georgetown University, solar power and photoelectric cells at MIT, ultrasound, at the University of Vienna. Now, what's interesting is one problem with universities is that they are often organized in different departments. We call this uh, the disciplinary silos. And these are the classic departments of chemistry, physics, biology, in the sciences and of course history, economics, political science, psychology, sociology, and the social sciences, and then you have the humanities with languages, uh, literature, arts, music, you know, everything is separated out. And uh, when it comes to innovation and uh, basic science and applied research, which are related to the real world, the real world is not necessarily optimally organized in each of these areas. So for example, if we look at uh, biology and we look at COVID-19, we look at the virus, is, the, is that a physics problem? The virus is you know, made of atoms and molecules and we can use ultraviolet light and we can use uh, uh, you know, other physical methods to destroy it? Is it a physics problem? It's a material. Is it a chemistry problem? Because it's molecules and those molecules will involve reactions and drugs are molecules and those drugs are doing things with the, with the, the virus and it's to some extent chemistry. Uh, obviously it's biology. So we have the immunology. What is the immune response? How do we do vaccines? These are all very biological questions. And then if we have a vaccine based on the biology and the chemistry and some physics, what if people don't wanna take the vaccine? We have these anti-vaxxer movements and that's psychology and sociology and polit political science. You know, what sorts of political systems do we need to help people to understand and learn and perhaps uh, convince and maybe even require. So imagine you have a vaccine program and you really wanna implement this. You need to engage the whole university, not just a bunch of scientists at a you know, lab and turn it on and say, here we have the vaccine. You need to have a whole interdisciplinary effort just to produce the vaccine and of course, the, the application of it. So this is true in general, but in particular, if we talk about the so-called fourth industrial revolution, what we are going through now, this uh, importance of interdisciplinary research becomes especially significant. Uh, and we call this technology convergence. So let me explain very quickly. So we are in the fourth industrial revolution, which implies, of course, we had three industrial revolutions before. So what was the first industrial revolution? 
that was in the uh, early 19th century, end of the 18th century, approximately, uh, and involved mechanization, water power, steam power. And basically, it was the steam engine. So this is a, a flame, this is a piston with steam, and it moves something up and down. What I mean to say is to summarize that the first industrial revolution could readily be encapsulated or described as the steam power revolution. The second industrial revolution involved mass production assembly line and one key innovation, which was electricity. So this is the end of the 19th century early 20th century, and that's the second industrial revolution. In other words, well-defined by electricity and the applications of that. The third industrial revolution uh, from the 1950s to the 1980s, 1990s, was computers and automation. And again, you can easily summarize this with computers. What is the fourth industrial revolution? Uh, there's a little phrase here, cyber physical systems, but in reality, the fourth industrial revolution will likely not be defined by one technology. It will defi be defined by the combination of technologies. So for example, some may say the fourth industrial revolution is artificial intelligence, AI. Is that true? Well, what is AI? AI has to be used with something, like with the drones, or with robots, or with uh, apps, right? That's AI. Is, uh, is are robots the uh, fourth industrial revolution? Well, the robots require other technologies, communication technologies. Is it mobile technologies? Is it biotechnology? So it's likely not going to be one type of technology, it's going to be the convergence of technologies. So that's why interdisciplinary research becomes especially important. So you have two dimensions, you have in this practical and applied, uh, practical research and basic research, and then in those areas, you have interdisciplinary research. Somehow, you need to combine them. So the structure of universities is not very good for interdisciplinary research. Uh, cultural historical experience, organizational disciplinary frameworks that have been there for hundreds of years shape research and knowledge. University organization and politics creates tension for multidisciplinary research. Uh, during periods of rapid social change, multidisciplinary research is strategic to support innovation and changes in organizational structure are needed to encourage this sort of multidisciplinary community partnerships. So actually the true innovation needs to be at the organizational level. So we need to have organizational innovation that can support these interdisciplinary projects and also support the connection between the applied and the basic between the university and the industry. So we're gonna move now into corporate research or industry research, describing it separately, but in the end, we really need to figure out ways to bring them together. So I mentioned this article a little bit earlier, but I wanna talk about it in a little bit more detail now. The relationship between innovation and value. This was an article that came out a few years ago in Forbes. Of course, it's just one representation. It's not the only article, but it was a nice summary that innovation is the only true way to create value. So how do you make money? How do you create value? Uh, if you look at basic economics, most of you are familiar with basic economics and supply and demand curves. And the whole concept of a supply and demand curve is that the supply matches the demand. And that will determine the quantity in the market and it will determine the price. And to make a long story short, you know, if you have multiple companies, you have multiple individuals, a free market, everyone's coming together, 
uh, in the end, you will achieve some sort of equilibrium in order to get to that uh, matching of demand and supply. So you achieve an equilibrium. And when you do this over a whole space of many companies and many individuals, that equilibrium will result in essentially a zero profit, right? Uh, and there have been mathematical proofs for this and, and it makes sense. If somebody's making a huge profit, more companies will come in because it's you know chance to make huge profit that means more supply more supply means the price goes down how do you make profit when the price goes down you make less profit more companies come in so in the long run we achieve an equilibrium of zero profit so the whole goal of a business is to be away from that equilibrium and there are two ways to stay away from the equilibrium. One is what we call rent seeking. And the second one is innovation. What is rent seeking? And rent seeking is a economics term for basically locking in a certain level of profit. How do you lock in a certain level of profit? How do you prevent the market from equilibrium? Well, one of them is patent protection. One of the reasons for patent protection is they don't want, you make some innovation, so you have a certain amount of time that you can keep that away and it doesn't equilibrate. So the existence of patent protection is in fact a proof, well not a proof, but it's a strong indicator that markets without that will tend to equilibrate and reduce profit to zero. So in order to incentivize you create a rent seeking situation where somebody uh, has a patent and they prevent further in innovation. So it's a very interesting situation. We, we're gonna talk about this at length in another lecture. Do patents encourage innovation? On one level, yes, but on another level, they create rent seeking. They create a barrier to innovation. So uh, that's a very interesting policy debate. What is the influence of patents on innovation? And they work both ways. Another way of rent seeking behavior is monopoly. So if Google uh, is innovative, but then by virtue of the innovation, they make it the only search engine and nobody else can do search engines, then they don't need to innovate. They lock it in there and uh, they create a disequilibrium and still profit, but they don't have to innovate, right? Another way of rent seeking is government regulation or making the government uh, require licensing or uh, permits or approvals or whatever it may be. Uh, when a drug company gets an FDA approval for something, the stock price goes way up. Why does it go way up? Because the investors know that with that approval comes a certain rent seeking opportunity. In other words, there will be profits coming in uh, for a certain period of time. And so the high stock price reflects that expectation. So the second way of creating value is via innovation. So you avoid the equilibrium by creating something new innovative. So we have different types of innovation. This is the problem definition, the innovation matrix, a well-defined or not well-defined domain. That's the uh, domain definition. And the problem is a not well-defined or well-defined problem. And we have four types of innovations that we described. Breakthrough, basic research, disruptive, and sustaining innovation. So, this basic research, like we described, that Vannevar Bush falls under mostly university related, and the sustaining innovation falls under mostly the industry. And it's these other areas of disruptive and breakthrough innovation that can be mixed between them. So we're going to talk about two examples of measuring innovation. 
as applied to companies. The first one is a Booz Allen Hamilton uh, um, method. This is actually a little bit old, uh, quite old from 2010, but it's the, uh, their uh, method of measuring top innovators. So in, based on R&D spending, uh, sales and research uh, intensity, uh, the most innovative companies, they, well, these are not the reasons, but uh, this is how they ranked them back in 2010. And what they saw was very interesting. If they talked about the top R&D spenders, there was not necessarily a correlation. So for example, uh, the top innovators had a performance that was higher than most uh, other average performance, but the top spenders had less of a performance in terms of uh, revenue growth. If you look at uh, profit as a percentage of revenue, the top innovators also had more. The top research were uh, also more, but uh, not as much as the top innovators. And if you look at growth of the market capitalization, how much the company is worth in the stock market, again, the top innovators exceeded the average and the top spenders and innovation, the top spenders in R&D were below that and below the average. So there is an interesting disconnect between the top innovators and the top research spenders. So according to this report, they identified four key innovation capabilities when it comes to corporate innovation. One is ideation, in other words, coming up with the idea. The second is project selection. The third is project product development and the fourth is commercialization. So notice this encompasses this span of innovation we described. It's not just coming up with new ideas, but it's uh, bringing them to reality in the case of industry that would be commercializing them. So ideation, project selection, product development and commercialization. Now, in these categories, you also have top areas that were ranked by their surveys. In ideation was deep consumer and customer insights and analytics. So that's actually very interesting. It's a little bit like Albert Einstein. He wants to come up with some ideas, but he sees what the patents are. They like the customer, the real world. So customer companies believe that the best way to ideate is not to sit isolated on your desk and dreaming up ideas, is to go out into the market and talk with customers, talk with consumers, and get their input. So do you remember a 3M example I gave? 3M with the masking tape. So, uh, the 3M uh, scientist goes into the auto painting shop and he sees they're using a tape in, in order to make the multicolored cars and the tape is not working. The, the paint is smearing. It's not very looking very clean, very sharp. So he says, we need a tape that doesn't stick very hard. And that led to masking tape. So he didn't dream up the masking tape in the lab. He dreamed it up by talking to the customers. Project selection also connected a key element to ongoing assessment of market potential. So Booz Allen, based on these capabilities of ideation, project selection, product development, commercialization, came up with three major innovation strategies. One is the need seekers that look for needs and develop products based on that. 3M would be a good example. There would be market readers and then companies that are more engineering driven or technology drivers. So a, another survey was the BCG survey, Boston Consulting Group, and they also come up with an annual survey. And their ranking was a little bit different. Apple was number one, Google number two, Samsung three, and so forth. 
What was an interesting point is that you had uh, Samsung, Hair, Hyundai, uh, and then others uh, were increasing, were these increasing conglomerates. So we often look at startups as being innovation centers. And we look at the big companies, especially like Google, for example, and the conglomerates and so forth, as being not innovative. It's a very interesting concept. According to this metric, and we'll talk about how it's different than the Booz Allen metric, uh, the conglomerates had an advantage. If we go back to what I said about the importance of interdisciplinary innovation and of the fourth industrial revolution, combining different innovations, companies that have a diverse mix of technologies and the ability to integrate them might have an advantage in innovation. So startups are typically focused on one technology. They're typically quite uh, focused and that's what venture capital firms want them to do. They're typically uh, less resources. So if you have a fourth industrial revolution concept that needs many technologies coming together, how is it possible for a smart a startup to do that? Uh, it's not so much, you know, we had uh, Apple computers started in the garage and uh, Google started in the garage and we have all these stories, but the world is a little bit changing. So if you want to have a technology that combines a robot with AI, with biotech sensing, uh, and so forth, uh, it's very difficult for a single company to do that. So the solution will be either conglomerates that are very uh, flexible, and that's difficult because big companies also have disadvantage for innovation, or ways of startups and making joint ventures and other sorts of combinations. That's the future of corporate innovation. So we have a strategy matrix if we want to describe uh, in two dimensions. One is companies that are more market pull, companies that are more tech push, companies that focus on radical innovation, companies that focus more on incremental innovation. All of the corporate strategies we talked about can uh, be sort of placed in these four quadrants. So we've talked about Michael Porter strategy, Chan Kim, W. Chan Kim, Blue Ocean Strategy. These are more in this quadrant of positioning. Uh, and the more incremental and market-oriented companies are focusing on execution. So you might have heard about Edwards Deming, uh, re-engineering the corporation, execution. Uh, so these are execution-related strategies. Uh, focusing on... Uh, your core areas based on technologies, competing for the future, uh, core competencies, these are also major business strategies. And then radical innovation modified by the market is called adaptation strategy. This would be in search of excellence, the rise and fall of strategic planning by Henry Mintzberg and so forth. So Philips, for example, is very, is a conglomerate. It's very focused on the consumer and market. Siemens is a very engineering driven company, more tech push. And G Healthcare is a lot more execution oriented. You might have heard about Six Sigma. Six Sigma is to reduce the errors and the quality. That comes out of GE. So uh, that's an important aspect of uh, innovation. So, how do companies choose their projects and their portfolios? So, this is a paper that uh, talks about uh, how you create R&D project portfolios. Most firms chase many more projects and ideas that they can execute successfully. So where should we develop these projects? Well, we have two dimensions, technical uncertainty and market uncertainty. So when the market uncertainty is very low, the technical uncertainty is very low, we call these enhancement launches, very incremental small changes. If the market uncertainty is very high and the technical uncertainty 
is very high, we call these stepping stone options, to go to a whole new paradigm, to go to a disruptive area. Uh, platform launches are medium and medium. Very high technical uncertainty, but some uh, market certainty would be positioning options. And then very high marketing uncertainty, but in a way technically uh, more accessible would be scouting options. So companies should try to spread their R&D, including startups, in all of these areas, roughly speaking. Uh, it's very easy to sometimes just go in these incremental areas, but you need to be thinking of some future options as well. Another very important aspect to companies and innovation is the importance of megatrends. Uh, this is the famous book in 1982, John Naisbitt of megatrends, and these were the 10 megatrends he predicted, becoming an information society, which has become true, technology being pulled into use from the market, what's appealing to people, that's also become very true. More global marketplace, short term to long term, not clear whether that's been so true. Decentralization has also become very true. From government to self-help, not sure how that has worked out. From representative to participative democracy, from hierarchies to networking, from Northeastern bias to a Southwestern one, that was in the United States. So many of these trends coming true. And mega trends are very important. What is a mega trend? It's uh, something that is a highly probable, sustained, secular, long-term trend with significant global transformatory multidimensional impacts throughout society. So the interesting thing about mega trends is that they are actually very predictable. So I'll talk about some mega trends here. Uh, and I split them into two parts, monopolar, like a megatrend going in one dimension, direction, and dipolar, a megatrend that represents sort of opposing trends coming at the same time. So one trend, of course, is digital culture. We all know it's happening. Urbanization, although COVID-19 may change that. Climate change, we know all of this is happening. Life is accelerating. Uh, markets are shifting from the developed to the emerging worlds. And another trend, maybe not as well known, but very clear is water wars, from plenty of water to scarcity of water. Now, why do I mention this in terms of innovation? If you look at all those companies that are very innovative, they often actually leverage take advantage, maybe that's not the right word, but align with these mega trends. Now, all of you here, all of your students, you know these mega trends, but not all of you are going to become as rich as Bill Gates. I'm not trying to be disappointing, but there are many factors for that. Some of it is luck, of course, but sometimes if you look at these stories, it's about people and companies that recognize a mega trend and were able to uh, move with that mega trend, create some value with that mega trend, which everyone else knew about too. So there's, it's more complicated than that, but if you want to be successful, especially very successful, you need to be studying these mega trends and not just saying, yeah, we know that, no big deal, but to find out ways to uh, take advantage of that. It's not always the small trends, it is the big mega trends. So all of you should be studying this time with COVID-19 because a lot of new trends are going to come out. Some of them will actually be obvious. Um, greater increased uh, emphasis on healthcare, um, uh, perhaps less uh, privacy uh, related to uh, minimizing these threats. We had the issue with privacy and the terrorism, but this is you know even more widespread. Terrorism has not killed lots of people around the world. Viruses can kill more people. So uh, there will be trends coming out of this. 
So another set of trends are dipolar. They're almost on the opposite. One is demographic change. Some nations are aging, but actually some regions are quite young. Japan is aging, Africa is very young. And then also globalization and anti-globalization occurring at the same time. Everybody talks about globalization, but we also have trends that are going against globalization. And then another interesting one is individualization and communitarianism. So individualization communitarianism means that people like to be more individual. Self-expression, the American way. But also people want to be in more communities. American way, not everybody likes that. So you have people coming in tighter communities. You have Yugoslavia was all together in one country, but uh, people want to be in their own communities. So they're opposite. Uh, and what's interesting about Facebook is that it tapped into both trends at the same time. So when you create your Facebook profile, you can be like individual. You can be special, you can be different, you can do self-expression. But in Facebook, you can be with friends in your own community. And so these are opposite trends, but Facebook is able to tap into both of them at the same time. So one reason why it's very successful. So we talked about open innovation before. So remember we talked about interdisciplinary research. We discussed technology convergence in the fourth industrial revolution, the new complexities of bringing together applied and basic research. How do you do all that? Is the answer is you just do everything and people can become Superman or Superwoman and that's the only way they can get anything done? The answer is likely to be organizational innovation around open innovation. So what is open innovation? It is the concept that uh, innovation, most of it is occurring what we cannot see. So if you're a company and you have 400 PhDs, but there's hundreds of thousands of PhDs produced in a country, how do you tap into all of this? Not just your talent. Uh, Procter & Gamble, our internal R&D can't keep up with exploding innovation demand. How do you bring outside innovation in? Like the Roman Empire we talked about. So the solution to the Procter & Gamble problem of innovation, corporate innovation, was not to hire 200,000 PhDs, of course, but to do their connect and develop system where they took ideas from the outside, wrote the agreements, uh, and more than 50% of Procter & Gamble's new products involve collaborations with external innovators. So closed innovation, we talked about this, and open innovation. So in closed innovation, everybody works in the company. Uh, they have to discover it, develop, ship it themselves, commercialize it. We get to the market first, create the best in ideas in the industry. We control our own intellectual property. Open innovation, where you're working with outside parties. Not all the smart people in the field work for us. We need to work with people inside and outside the company. External R&D can create value. We don't have to do all the research to profit. Building a better business model and improving is more important than just entering first. And we can share in the intellectual property. So Philips was also a pioneer in open innovation. This was the original Philips Research Headquarters in Eindhoven is a little bit of cartoon. You see they're isolated. There's a guard here. The person is inside this beautiful campus looking out. They transformed their innovation into open high-tech campus with many buildings, many people, many countries. Uh, you know, not all this sharp divide between the inside and the outside. And uh, they went from everything 100% inside the business to lots of technology spinning out, external suppliers, joint businesses, spinning of technology. That's the Philips. Samsung also 
has tried to do very similar. Uh, they have business units, business unit R&D center, and this long-term radical uh, advanced institute of technology. And this is where I work with uh, Samsung at the uh, site. So they've done a open innovation system, again, to bring in ideas. And they did what's called a global research outreach uh, with uh, different themes, lots of money. Each uh, lab gets $100,000 and they bring a lot of labs from all around the world to bring in uh, ideas. Uh, so when I was at Samsung, I created a kind of virtual terahertz medicine research institute. So this is actually the scientific idea that uh, has motivated me is a new kind of medicine based on the properties of proteins and their electrodynamic implications. So this is a protein, and this protein, as you can see, is not solid, it's a vibrator. So if we take this concept, this is number one, proteins vibrating. We also know the proteins are composed of charges and we also know that moving charges by the laws of electromagnetism emit and absorb electromagnetic energy. That means these proteins are emitting and absorbing electromagnetic energy. So we call this protein electrodynamics. And when I was at Samsung, I organized kind of a virtual institute around this for medical imaging based on terahertz, medical spectroscopy. Uh, this was at Ohio State University. This was an MIT. We wrote two papers out of this. We got one patent out of this one. And medical treatment to influence those protein functions with the University of Southampton. This experiment actually, for technical reasons, did not succeed. So this was sponsored by Samsung, but it was Ohio State University, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and University of Southampton Optoelectronics Research Center, pulling all those together. So this was actually in 2013 and 2014. Why is this important? Uh, this is important because I actually plan to do something similar in the coming months to years, depends on how things work out. Uh, as a way of having new approaches to diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19. So as you know, these viruses have proteins on them. And those proteins are responsible for binding to the cells, they're responsible for infecting the cells, uh, and so forth. If we can detect those proteins and interfere with those proteins electromagnetically, that will be a new form of diagnosis and treatment. Now, one company cannot do this. This is physics, this is biology, very different you know, specialties. So we have to do some sort of uh, open innovation institute. So as things develop, I'll keep you posted, but I'm teaching you innovation now. I'm teaching you corporate innovation. That's what your future you wanna do. But I'm telling you this because I'm, uh, actually trying to do this type of thing as we speak. So I'm not just you know, teaching and academic, et cetera. We're trying to do the real thing. So that's the end of the lecture. We finished Innovation in Academia and Business, University and Corporate Research Labs. Next lecture, we're gonna try to get a little more detail that important question, very difficult question. How do we measure innovation, innovation measurement? And then some specific methods of innovation, brainstorming, TRIZ, empathy, et cetera. We'll do some little bit of uh, not just lecture, but uh, practice. So that will be next week. So that's the end of uh, today's uh, lecture. Uh, I'll stop the recording and we'll take some questions.